Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook live broadcast. I'm Steve Altitian, Director of Client Partnerships here at Pacific Cascade Family Law. And today we're with psychotherapist Fujian Zain to talk about the psychological process of divorce and getting through it. Good morning, Fujian. How are you doing today? Good morning, Steve. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you oh, for uh, the opportunity of being able to uh, chat with you. Oh, and thank you for being here. So before we start, can you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Of course. I've been a psychotherapist and a life coach for about 30 years, and I work, uh, my license is a marriage and family. So obviously I work a lot with families, you know, pre, uh, pre uh, marriage, throughout the marriage, uh, pre-divorce, through divorce, after divorce. Uh, so there's a lot of experience through that. And I have uh, developed a psychology and an educational theory and interventions called awareness integration theory, um, which, uh, you know, we're teaching in the universities, all the therapists are learning, we're certifying um, a lot of coaches. And I'm also an author through that, which is this, the book Life Reset, uh, which is a for people, um, it goes through the exercises for people to become aware, integrate, and I also bring that approach to um, the divorce therapy there. Wow, perfect person for today. So, you know, we've had several Facebook lives about the legal process of divorce, you know, which could be complex, it can be daunting, there's legal filings, there's discovery, negotiating custody, sport, parenting time, you know, temporary orders, final decree. It's really why having an attorney that's skilled in divorce is so important. But today, I want to talk about another process that occurs in divorce, and you call it the psychological process of divorce, which also can be complex and daunting and in need of a skilled professional to, to successfully get through it. So let's start by what you mean when you use the term, the psychological process of divorce. Sure. You know, when people are getting together, they usually have a honeymoon phase that you only see the best in the other person. And even if you see some stuff that are not working, you're like, I'll handle it. I'll tolerate it. It will all be okay. I'll change it. And then we go through this, you know, beyond the fed, you go um, like a, a power struggle phase then, you know, we power struggle through it. No, it has to be my way. Then we bargain. And a lot of um, marriages through these power struggle phases, they decide that's it. I'm done. I'm just, you know, it's not the same as before and we're going to be done. And some people work through this process and live a long time and try things and still go through um, a process of, okay, I've grown up. I don't no longer want this marriage. It doesn't work for me, although it looks like it works, but it just doesn't work for me internally anymore. But what happens in the process of uh, being together, whether it's the power struggle phase or just like mundane phase, it's that the part that everything we saw about our partner was great and we could tolerate and accept the others flips, which now I see all the things I don't like about him or her. Everything else out there irritates me. But when it actually, the, the concept of divorce shows up, is when I've become hopeless. So because, you know, sometimes I've asked Steve, when people came in, like, you know, you've been struggling for so many years. Why is it that today you suddenly talked about divorce? It's because I'm completely, utterly hopeless and powerless now against this. And I'm done. So there's a piece that you become done. But when, how do you get to done is a lot of times this bargaining thing, which is, let me try a little bit. See, it's not working. Let me try just a little bit more. Mm, no, it's not working. And finally, it's like, it's never going to work. And that assignment that we put on the future that ends. So we say the future that I have in my head is never going to be there. So I'm going to finish it. And then we go through all of the emotional processes that um, you know, we go with any type of change or loss, we go through a grief and loss at the beginning or in the middle of, of this process. Another aspect of it, Steve, is two people in the process never get done at the same time. Some people grieve the process, they, uh, they finally get themselves ready for this process, and by the time they're all already saying, I'm done, 
they already completed their grieving process as much as they could. And then they share this with their partner and the partner becomes surprised and they just begin now their grieving process. They bargain, but what if this? And what we could do this? And a lot of times, those are the times that sometimes they come to me where you know, we're working through the marriage and or the divorce process. And those are the first times I think that they sometimes come to you um, as an attorney, because I hear like, okay, I went to an attorney to check, but I'm not, you know, maybe I could bargain again. So they do the first visit and then they come back and try until they're actually done. So you, it sounds like, you know, can step in at various phases of it. Um, and I, I, I noticed you, 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 we had talked a little bit and you you'd used a term once that you called unbalanced focusing. And I thought that was just really interesting. And you also, you know, talk about your awareness and, and how does, you know, how does that work in kind of going down and then coming back up through the through the, the whole process? Well, for example, right before we uh, are, are speaking, I had a session with someone and she was saying, I love him. I want to be with him and I want to create this life to work better. And then two seconds later, everything I was saying, she's like, "Ugh, no, it will never happen. He will never change. He's this and is that. And I'm like, the monster you've created in your head, it's hard to live with. So it's that piece of, we kind of split and we make the other person a monster in our, in our head. And then we're constantly responding to the monster we created in our head. And the hope of maybe the honeymoon stage still lingers. So we hope for this, but we're not necessarily behaving in the, in the marriage towards what we said we wanted we're behaving toward the monster we created and that's how the process gets worse and worse and at one point it's like you can't live any longer with the monster you created because the way that you behave toward that monster it creates a space where the other person acts upon it as that monster you just created like they they fill up the role you assign the role to them and they come in and fill up the role for you and that's when usually then, you know, the talk of divorce and the action of divorce and finally going and filling up the vapor, seeing the attorneys start. Now, this process is very different for people who have children or you, they don't, because obviously they still have to communicate because of the kids. They still hold the relationship because of the kids which is different when somebody doesn't have a kid, they can separate, they can move away, they don't have to deal with each other and they can go through their um, kind of remorse and grief and loss stages uh, individually while the, uh, the marriages who have kids, this concept, it doesn't happen individually. Sometimes these processes continues and then the kids are in the middle and they have to continue communication and negotiation every day because of the kids throughout the process of divorce after divorce for so many years maybe until really death do them apart what's the best time to to get you involved it it, it seems like if they're in a hopeless kind of you know sadness situation and it's got to be tough to get out of it by yourself. Very much, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that the best time for anybody to go seek counseling is in, um, in previous uh, premarital section, because I think that they learn skills and how to be with each other from the beginning. So you uh, bypass a lot of the traumas and damages that you already create for each other. So if there are times that they can go to a counseling before uh, they actually get married, that would be the best. Then different phases of life together causes a lot of stress and many people don't know how to do it. So when their uh, power struggle stages happens, when the uh, listen, uh, handling in-laws, <laughs> handling finances, uh, handling children, handling sexuality, some of these conversations that happens in every single marriage, if they don't know how to handle it, 
um, they will wound each other. They will traumatize each other and themselves. So the, at every stages of life that changes and they see that there are some struggles and they're not passing through, it might be a good idea to come back to the therapist that they you know, started with or anyone. And they will pass through that phase. They will learn new skills on how to handle this phase as they move forward and to the next, to the next. If that, that, that makes so much sense. The sort of legal side of that, as you're talking, I think of, of you know prenuptial agreements, premarital agreements, which sort of makes you do the same thing on a legal basis. Talk about your stuff, <laughs> talk about the you know what could happen, and and understand expectations. Because one of the things that you we again talked about was, and we see it all a lot in, in divorces, is unmet expectations. You know, and at that, anything you can do to reduce that, it seems like it goes a long way to help, like you said, make the stress less and, and make people kind of see what, you know, what the real expectation should be. Yes. And, you know, sometimes we do know about what we expect and we can share it up front. Many times we don't know because it's the first time we've been married. We have no idea. Or it's the first time we're married to this person. Even if it's not our first marriage, we're still the first time that we're married to this particular person. So communication is the only place that we could do something about because each person is living in their own bubble. And each person is responsible for how they bring any information from that bubble into the us bubble, which is the, the ticket, you know, the us here. There's a lot that goes on and, and uh, because of miscommunication. The another thing is let's figure out how to fight appropriately and fairly, because fighting is going to happen. Arguing is going to happen. Debating is going to happen. We're two people you know, from different backgrounds, from, you know, different essences. So we're coming together and we can't read each other's mind. So regardless of the content or the subject that we are debating about, uh, the way we come together and communicate, negotiate, debate, look at, you know, prioritize together, that is what creates a successful marriage and will keep the love alive. It keeps the safety alive and all of that. But if the miscommunication happens and we keep perceiving and assuming and live based on our own assumptions, then we, we're going to be uh, further and further away from each other. And, you know, we also bring a lot of our childhood stuff or a lot of the way that our parents related to each other as automatic stuff, you know, and bring it in. And one of the things that we do in awareness integration is really become aware of my thought process, my emotional process, my behavior, and then how does that impact my marriage? What do I bring from the past that I need to complete and you know stop the triggering? What is it that I've learned which was worked and bring it in? What is it that I've learned that it doesn't work and I, I need to stop? And be aware of every day that we're together and what I can do and what I can, because I'm the only one who I can control. I can control my thought process or emotional and action versus constantly look at my mate and say, well, obviously I'm the best and he or she's got to change. And I'm waiting. When is the change going to happen? <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of, it's like being analytical about yourself and in you know, again, it's, it's people go to work and their jobs and they can be very analytical and then they come home and that whole, well, analytical doesn't belong in a marriage kind of a situation, but it sounds like, well, that's not maybe really true. Maybe it is important in a marriage situation. Very much. One of the ways that we work is um, you want to look at that you have belief systems, you have thought processes, and you create a world about yourself about what marriage is. And then that's where the expectations also that you were talking about shows up. I need to know what kind of expectation, what kind of world have I created about marriage and how do I feel about it? And how do I act toward my mate from that? Then we have this aspect that we, we live in our assumptions. Like everybody assumes how their mate is going to be there. And I'm sure you've heard it a lot. Well, I know he thinks of me like that, or I know that he's going to do this or this, or she's going to do this or this. And I'm like, well, how do you know? Did you check? No, but I know. 
but the behavior doesn't show. Yeah, but, or um, he should know what I need before I tell him, because if I tell him I need this, it's just no longer valuable. So there's this assumptive concept, concept that is hovering and we live in. And we don't really reality check. And sometimes it's so much easier when we actually reality check it from the other person. Uh, what do you need? What are your, you know, what, how can I support you? What's going on with you? And all of those helps just to bring clarity for us. And then we take ourselves everywhere. So if I think I'm fat, if I think I'm not good enough, if I think I'm not good in bed, if I think I'm this and I'm that, it doesn't matter how much my mate tells me, oh, you're wonderful. I'm still going to say, no, I'm not. And there is this piece that shows up where it's not accurate. Like our system and what we believe in the bubble we live in might not be accurate to what is in reality happening within the, within the marriage. So that analytical um, piece that you were sharing, the observational piece, the awareness piece is very important if we're gonna live in reality versus some fantasy that we're always living. And then knowing what we bring from the past but also being intentional. I was asking my client, I said, the best scenario, what do you see in your marriage? And she told me this beautiful scenario. And I said, now, if we looked at the video of yesterday when you guys had you know, your argument and I took him away and I just, and the two of us just watched you and your behaviors, the wordings you use, your body language, every message you were giving, were you behaving toward the, the, the beautiful ideal, ideal relationship you just explained. And she says, no. I said, then are your thought process as you're standing beside him similar to what you said you wanted? No. Were your feelings similar? No. Were your behaviors going toward that? No. Like, well, how are you going to get to what you want if your own thought, if your own emotion and your own behavior doesn't take you there? at all? Are you expecting like, I'm just going to be here and somebody else take me there and you're expecting him to take you there? Or this is your vision and you're responsible to get yourself there. And it's that piece where you, when you become intentional about this is what I say I want. So therefore, I'm going to walk my words and I'm going to do what I say I want in the hopes that the dance with my mate will also collaborate and create, you know, a beautiful marriage. If, obviously, a lot of this stuff can help marriage. I mean, we're, you know, and, and help prevent divorce and, and make people happier. And it's like, but it is a job, but it's a great job kind of it's you know it's a, it's a it's the best job but it's still a job uh, so what what is there a switch that goes on or does that does the focus change when the legal process starts i mean it, it is 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 there a different angle that people start to take a look once there's a filed divorce or once the divorce decree is finalized. See, when we get together, we are looking for being an us. So everything we do is toward this us, right? Although in the marriage, some people, you know, think about me, 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 and what do I need for me? But still, you know, we keep going, okay, what's, what's best for me, but ultimately look at the us. The minute divorce shows up, the us breaks and it's now me. It's like, how do I protect myself? How do I take care of myself? How do I, from a legal perspective, um, know as far as finances, how do I look at the future and all of that? Then the element of unfairness shows up. Well, what you're offering is unfair and I deserve such and so. So there's an entitlement section that shows up for each person that in order to protect myself, this is what I'm entitled to. This is what the law tells me I'm entitled to. Uh, this is what I think I'm entitled to, regardless of what the law says that I'm entitled to. And then, uh, and then it also, if there's child custody, so all of the issues about children now shows up about uh, negotiation of time, which is a lot of times also um, 
the time is uh, added to the money. So it's, it's kind of like linked to that. So there's a lot more that happens in that section. Um, and then there is an, if they can't emotionally enforce something, then they will play the same game now with attorneys involved. So if I feel it's unfair and I feel that um, I want to see my child or I want to you know, play a game or I'm just going to be stubborn about something, now I have an ally that I'm also going to play the game with them because they're powerful and they can go because we can't talk. So the focus changes from us to me and what works for me, and I'm going to win regardless. And I'm going to be really pissed if I lose at any point of this. My anger is going to go up because I expect to win this game. Um, this is how the focus changes. It, what I tell uh, people who are, have um, children is, can we get their can we get the communication right? Because regardless of whether you wanna be with each other or not, if you have children, you've got to communicate and negotiate. So that skill still needs to be there uh, for the two of you, you know, to raise your children together um, for the next whatever 20 years and be in, in each other's life by force, you know, or by choice. Um, so the communication is something that allows them to negotiate and for both of them to feel a little bit of a win-win in this, in the, the, in the whole process, because if it's just one person winning, it's going to be a disaster because the other person will always feel like a victim and that space of victimization will funnel through the conversation with the children and then children will become the, um, you know, the tool for that victimization piece. The then the process. Let, you know, let's say someone has is using you um, long before that. There's been a filing for a divorce, and they're and they're all trying. And then there's the divorce happens. I take it that doesn't mean that they failed, and they don't need you anymore, or they don't need to continue to try to to do these things we're talking about anymore. Um, but that feeling of failure has got to kind of come into play at some point. The feeling of failure is always around divorce. Part of it, I think, is because the way that we are um, uh, wired or and heard through our childhood, you know, until death do us support. I mean, this is what we say when we're getting married. So people are getting married for a lifetime. They're not getting married. If they don't look at it as, you know, I'm going to do a lease with option to buy. And then at one point I give up the lease and just give, give the car back. Somehow there's this notion that we're, you know, when I marry is for a lifetime. So when the marriage doesn't work because it, it defies the original intention or the fantasy that we hold, then it appears to be a failure. We don't have the same mentality when it goes to work or, or businesses. We don't say that the first, per, you know, the first job I've ever had, I'm going to keep for the rest of my life, um, or the first business I've had, we're going to keep for the rest of my life. People grow and grow out of one, you know, job or career or something and move to the next. But family is supposed to be forever. So uh, when, when somebody marries, it appears I'm creating another family. So letting go of that family appears to be a failure. And then we work through that concept of, of what we've learned from a marriage, how we have grown through this whole process, how much uh, the growth has happened by watching, um, watching the debates, watching what I've learned from the other person and expanded myself. Um, what are the things that I've learned that I've never could have known without this? What are the things that I can, what are the fantasies that I had that when I faced reality was different? And um, how can I take this learning that I've had and produce a different type of marriage or uh, a relationship and a future for myself? So you shift anything that is appears to be a failure or a mistake and uh, shift it to a growth process for yourself and move, you know, move forward with it. That, you know, it kind of gets to, you know, getting, coming out the other end. Um, you know, what is, 
what is, I guess you would say, completing the marriage, um, getting it not just behind you, but like you said, uh, kind of getting it, making it a thing that, you know, results in something new that you're excited about. Yes. First of all, I usually, what I've noticed in this past 30 years, um, Steve is, it takes about one year almost for normal, for not a complicated grief process uh, or a complicated in the divorce process. Um, it takes usually one year from the day that you actually receive your um, divorce papers, not when you file, but when it's received in your, you know, in your mail. Um, and you go through different aspects of grief. So it's like section by section that you go through the next level of grief and then the next one. So the first one is like, okay, somebody talks about grief and then the divorce, you go to a, um, a, um, an attorney, you watch the papers, you're actually signing the papers. And for the first time, there's this, all of these emotional reactions. Then you kind of get used to that piece. Then it's the matter of removing yourself from the premise of that you guys were living together. And that goes through its own phase. Then it's a matter of who am I as a single person again? And what is my identity? How can I be different? And that's another system. Then it's watching your, your mate with your children and you no longer have the same control. That is another level of kind of like grief that you go through and then you have to adjust that, yeah, I'm not in control all the time. Then you see your mate probably dating or somebody talks about it. Then you have another level of grief. You also have all of these people around you who want to talk about your life and your divorce and how you were and not were and what they heard from the other person. You got to pass through those levels of grief. And finally, you know, watching your mate with someone else, that's another level of grief. And then, you know, uh, the paper shows up and then it completes it. And then, up. so these are the phases. And at any phase, depending on how, you know, your belief system is a thought process and emotional process, you kind of get, you can get stuck or you can learn and move forward. And the best learning process is again, looking at how was I here? What did I do as a mistake? What is it? Did I learn from the other person? How can I take that to the, to the next level of my life and watching the whole part as, as a growth process. And I usually say, stop your anger and hatred. I want you to honor your decision and all of these years that you chose to be with this person. Honor yourself because there was a reason why you were there. And we could go back at each section and you can watch why you made that decision. So honor those decisions and honor the, the, the day that you said you're complete and you're moving on. And in this way, you can you know clear up the kind of like negativity and toxicity and come out with a diamond the jewel of you know kind of like shining about the era of, of the era of your life that you know you learned so much from yeah you, you and again kind of reaching back to you, you become more aware of yourself but it, it sounds like you also become more aware of you know other people you know your ex-spouse you know things that you you may have said, well, this is just a dirty, rotten rat. Well, maybe not necessarily. Uh, and that, it seems like that's kind of part of that completion process. Yes, we have, to, we have to hate them in order to let go. It's kind of hard to say, I love them all as well. Everything's beautiful with them and I want them, but I gotta go. Um, so, in, you've got to choose out, even for the people who are not ready for divorce and their mates are the ones who are getting a divorce, they get stuck. For that group, they get stuck because they're not choosing the divorce. They're a victim of a divorce. So their part process of healing is actually starting to choose the divorce. For that group, in order to choose the divorce, is reshaping their focus in all the things that weren't working in the relationship until they choose divorce after they choose divorce and then that grief process starts and then they can forgive and then honor themselves and put that play you know it all in perspective again but that's usually what happens in order to for us to get a divorce we have to see the worst in the person 
and go into a hopeless place that it just isn't working in order to choose the divorce. When it's over, when someone reaches this conclusion, this, this, this completion, um, like I said, it could be shortly after the divorce, could be quite a while after the divorce. Um, are they no longer in need of any, you know, counseling? Is, is this something that, okay, now you can go away and um, hopefully you'll remember this stuff on your next marriage or is, or is this something that, that can help on a continuing basis because, okay, I've, I've gotten past that one. So I don't need help. Is, is that really true? I think that it's that the healing that needs to happen after we are out of a process is very important because if we don't get healed, we take those kind of resentments and triggers with us to the next relationship. Another a part that I really request from people is start learning about tools that would make an effective relationship the greatest. There's so many books out there. There's so many podcasts. There's so many movies. There's so many things that you can actually watch, learn, bring it into your system to learn how to effectively have an amazing relationship together. We are the first relationship we've ever born into is our own parents' relationship. If it was healthy, great. You know, it gave us some tools. If it wasn't, well, you know, we, we have the lack there. and We have to go learn. Maybe our original relationships, the first ones that, you know, everybody kind of gets traumatized and rejected and all of that, you know, those weren't the best role models for us. And if our marriage didn't work, obviously we didn't have a great role model and an experience. So I request for people to start really studying, learning what tools are amazing for a relationship that just works. Like it doesn't matter in what relationship, it works. Communication skills work negotiation skills work. So uh, those are the things that I think people need to learn. They can do it through therapy. They can do it through, you know, self uh, education. Um, and then usually when they go into the next relationship or dating process, sometimes they could use help again in seeing that whatever they've learned, now they can utilize it as they're going through a dating process and, you know, the beginning phases of relationship to see if they're assessing appropriately they're assessing you know for the right person they're communicating straight through and they're doing a good job on communicating um and those are all the different phases of life again that sometimes it's uh, support having a support as a mirror as a clear mirror uh really helps a person to move from one stage of life to the next wow and all, it's such great insight. And of course, 30 minutes just flew by. And so we're going to have to close. But can you, before we close, thank you so much for doing this. It was just a terrific amount of insight on a really um, not easy, complex kind of, you know, deal. And, and you really helped kind of guide us through that. But can you, can you let someone know if, if they're interested in, in talking with you, how would they get a hold of you? Sure. Go to my website, fujanzain.com, F-O-O-J-A-N-Z-E-I-N-E.com. Um, or, you know, go to any of the social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, any of those, Dr. Fujan Zain, and I'd love to hear from you and um, uh, be a support. I know it's a difficult support for anyone in their life. It doesn't matter whether you choose it or uh, someone's chosen it for you to be divorced, it's a hard process. And I love to be able to support people through it. Oh, thank you so much. And again, everyone who's turned in, thank you also for joining us today. Uh, anyone with questions, obviously, on today's topic can get a hold of Fujian by the, any of the, the means she, she talked about, or you can post your questions here and we can get you connected with Fujian as well. And then until next time, as I say, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay happy.